Welcome to the Emerging Civil War Podcast. I'm Chris Mikowski, and joining me today from Shenandoah University is my friend and fellow Buffalo Bills fan, Jonathan Noyales. Jonathan, how are you today? I'm I'm doing well. Got to got to bring up those bills. Go Bills! That's right. We got to be hopeful for it, right? That's right. So, Jonathan is the director of the McCormick Civil War Institute at Shenandoah, and I'm going to ask him to tell us a little bit about that in just a second. But I've invited him to uh, join us today because. We have a new book in the Emerging Civil War series coming out that Jonathan has penned about a little-known action that deserves a lot of attention. So, Jonathan, tell us about the blood-tinted waters of the Shenandoah. Yeah, so it's it's a book that explores a battle that has, I think, largely been forgotten in the Shenandoah Valley, the Battle of Cool Spring. Uh, it's really a two-day engagement fought along the banks of the Shenandoah River, July 17th and 18th, 1864, um, in Clark County. So it's actually the the largest and bloodiest Civil War engagement fought in Clark County, Virginia during the Civil War. There were about 13,000 troops engaged, about 1,000 casualties. And it's really oftentimes been seen as a footnote um, to Jubal Early's withdrawal from Washington, D.C. So, you know, the night of July 12th, 1864, Jubal Early uh, withdrew from the gates of Washington, crosses over the Blue Ridge through Snickers Gap on July 16th. And then, of course, you have this, this very large pursuit force commanded by Union General Horatio Wright coming out of Washington. Uh, they clash there along the banks of the Shenandoah on July 17th and 18th. Uh, it results in a Confederate victory. And, you know, it, it's it's always sandwiched between, you know, Early's push to Washington and Sheridan's ascendancy. But this is a battle that, that has a lot of profound impact on how President Lincoln um, is thinking about the war in the Shenandoah Valley and its relationship to the defense of Washington. Um, it's one of those critical steps um, in the eventual appointment of Philip Sheridan to command of the Army of the Shenandoah. And as I argue in the book, um, this is a battle that has, like all battles, a very profound impact on soldiers and the families of soldiers who are killed or maimed or you know, emotionally altered by what happened out there. One of the things I love most about this book is the tremendous amount of research you've done on those individual soldiers. And this book is packed not only with anecdotes, but little biographies and histories about what happened to these men and how they were affected. Tell us a little bit about like how you went about pulling that together, because that's a lot of people to keep track of. It is. So, you know, one of the questions I always am asked when I write a book is how long did it take you? And I mean, really, Cool Spring has been something that I have been researching um, myself, and also I have to acknowledge my students over the course of the past decade. So when Shenandoah University um, was entrusted with the care of a 195-acre parcel of the Cool Spring Battlefield back in 2013, the property was protected by the American Battlefield Trust, which of course, you know, your, your listeners and viewers are, are well familiar with the important work that they do. Um, I was entrusted with trying to figure out how to interpret that site. Because there really was no interpretation at Cool Spring, nothing that that the average tourist could come and, and walk and try to gain a, a sense of what happened there. And I remember having conversations with people um, saying that, you know, Cool Spring should just be discounted because it wasn't Gettysburg. It wasn't Antietam. It was, you know, there weren't a lot of casualties. And I thought, wow, what a, a cold, callous, heartless soul you are. Um, but that conversation, I think, really helped um, focus things for me a bit. And, you know, I thought back to my days in graduate school at Virginia Tech with Bud Robertson. And Bud Robertson was always a strong proponent that history, regardless of what time period you're studying, history at its core is about people. And I thought, this is the hook, you know, so people aren't going to come to Cool Spring wanting to know about some great strategic or political consequence. I mean, you know, I'm not naive. It, it doesn't have the the, you know, the gravity of, of Antietam or Gettysburg or Chattanooga or something like that. So I thought we need to tell the stories of, of the individual soldiers who fought at Cool Spring and really use it kind of as a microcosm to understand the war from the level of the soldier. And I thought that Cool Spring was a manageable battle to look at the biographical backgrounds of every single person who was killed there, Union or Confederate. So there's about 165 Union and Confederate soldiers who perished or were mortally wounded at the Battle of Cool Spring. And so a number of years ago, my students and I uh, started going through pension files, uh, widows' pensions and mothers' pensions at the National Archives to really see what could we uncover 
about these guys. And so it's amazing. And this really kind of, you know, you've read the book and this kind of comes out um, in the book is that within those pension files are contained not just, you know, oh, you know, Private Robert Butler of the 15th West Virginia was killed, but there are these very detailed um, and I think powerful accounts of letters written by officers who survived that battle, officers who commanded these guys in combat, you know, writing about their last moments um, to a wife or to a mother and really explaining, you know, the horrors of, of the battlefield at Cool Spring. And one of the, the most profound letters uh, we came across within those pension files at the National Archives uh, was from Captain John Chamberlain of the uh, 116th Ohio. And he wrote in there about the death of Sergeant David Terry, actually died and was buried on Parker's Island, which sits midway uh, in the Shenandoah River. And he has this moment, you know, and you, you, you've kind of read these letters, Chris, over the course of, of your career, where the officer is saying, we're so sorry, you know, we sympathize with you, our prayers and thoughts are with you. And that's kind of typical. What I think is atypical um, in this letter is where Chamberlain um, pauses after he's written, oh, we sympathize with you and your sorrow. And then he really thinks, well, what does that really mean? Like, we offer thoughts and prayers, but what does it really mean? And so this is really a way, I think, by researching these soldiers to understand, you know, not only what happens to them, but how how the war is impacting the guys who are left behind. Because I think that Sergeant Terry's death really forced Captain Chamberlain to think about, okay, I've been writing these words, but they really don't have any meaning. They're not doing anything to really sustain you as a mother and as a widow in this in this great time of crisis. Yeah. And I think that it's a remarkable achievement of the book to that, that brings so many of these stories into focus. And, and we could do that on any Civil War battlefield, but when you've got you know 190,000 guys in the wilderness, it's a little harder to do that when you than than when you've got 160 right. some you know at Cool Spring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and you're you're absolutely right, and that's why I thought that it was really a great approach to kind of you know dig deep. And you know my students and I have been researching these guys for almost a decade now. Um, and one of the, the really cool things about this is that it's not only, you know, the research conducted at the National Archives, it's also uh, being able to connect with descendants of these people. Um, so the, the individual to whom the book is dedicated, Mike Smith, um, he passed away several years ago. He had an ancestor who fought in the 18th Connecticut, um, drowned in the Shenandoah River during the Union withdrawal. Um, and so I've been able to, you know, obviously pick Mike's brain when he was alive and, and he shared documents with me from the family archives and I've established a relationship with the family. So it's, it's telling that story, but also kind of helping people who are, you know, three or four generations now removed, able to kind of help carry their, their family legacy forward a little bit. And that's gotta be a, an extraordinary opportunity for your students. What's it like, you know, over 10 years to be working with students and these files and these soldiers and, you know, tell me about some of those light bulb moments that your students get to experience. Yeah. It. Yeah. So, you know, our students at Shenandoah, um, I'm always telling them that in order to be, in order to make it in the history field, you have to do more than just go to class and be a good student and take tests. You really have to engage in the work of the historian, which is looking at, you know, those, those primary documents and doing that archival work. Um, and those are the moments, whether it was this project or other projects I've worked on with my students, um, having them engage in those in those primary resources, um, it's really exciting. So there's there's one student in particular uh, who comes to mind. He um, was a lacrosse player at Shenandoah, now has gone on to, to graduate school in history. Um, but kind of the light bulb moment for him he was researching Dwight Chickering. So Dwight Chickering was a soldier in the 34th Massachusetts. Uh, he was mortally wounded at the battle. Um, his comrades carried him across from the west side of the river to the east side, which is property that's owned by uh, the university. And he uncovered this account about how his comrades buried him in a garden uh, near Judge Richard Parker's retreat. And so Judge Parker, of course, as, as you know, was the judge who presided over John Brown's trial. He actually owned um, the property that the university now owns. And for this student, you know, watching him uncovering the story of Chickering 
and what his comrades did and where they buried him, I think this was the first time he felt an intimate connection to the past. So like I, I've, I've seen students, like they understand, you know, why things happen and when things happen. Um, but, you know, that student uncovering a photograph of Dwight Chickering from an obscure, um, you know, local history where he was from in Massachusetts to reading that account, um, I think that gave him his first intimate moment with history because he's seeing these individuals not as some far off distant characters, but as real, you know, living, breathing human beings. I think too, a neat kind of uh, result of that is, you know, these people become real human beings, as you say, and it reminds us that these are not numbers. Um, these are not arrows on a map, but these are real people. And, and, you know, cool spring might be an event that a lot of people have overlooked, but for those guys who were killed there or who were wounded there, that was everything. It was literally yeah. everything. Yeah. There was a, a, a colleague of mine, a good friend, Joe Whitehorn, many, many years ago, he was a historian for the army and, he always told me, and this again is, is something I've carried with me throughout my career, is that, you know, the way that, that we think of what's big in history and the way that a historical actor thinks what's big are totally different. Because the biggest moment for someone in the Civil War um, is when they lost that loved one. You know, whether it was on the picket line or whether it's at a, at a smallish battle like Cool Spring. And so, yeah, I mean, this is, this is what is really brought out um, in this book that, you know, you can't just judge a battle based on statistics. Um, and I know sometimes, and, and we all do it, we fall into the the trap of, you know, well, what would I have done if I was here? And, and you know, we look at, and we, we try to play gentle a little bit, and that has a place. Um, but I think sometimes we have a penchant to dehumanize what happens on the battlefield. You know, oftentimes, I remember a tour I gave at Cool Spring, it's probably been, you know, eight or nine years ago now, talking about the pace of the Union Army that was pursuing from Washington. And, you know, this, this person on the tour was just attacking Horatio Wright and the Union soldiers, saying, well, if I was in command, I would have marched quicker. And I'm like, do you have any idea what the weather conditions were <laughs> in mid-July 1864? It's, you know, 95 plus degrees, 100 percent humidity. These guys are exhausted, they're dragging, you know, it's not ideal conditions in your GMC terrain, you know, driving, you know, west out of Washington. Um, and I think sometimes people, people forget that. And I hope that this is one of the things that this book does, aside from just telling the story of Cool Spring, is that it, it brings in a lot of that, that human element to it. And also that people start to think about the ripple effects. So, you know, we, we talk a lot about the casualties, you know, and, and whether it's, 620,000 or the revised figure of 750,000. Um, you know, you think about the widows and the kids who are left behind and the orphans who are left behind. Um, I mean, there are millions and millions and millions of people who are impacted um, by what happens on the battlefield, however large or small. Now, this book is a direct result of the work you've done at Cool Spring and the battlefield and the management. And so it's kind of a, like a neat next step in the work that you've been doing. You mentioned that the battlefield was preserved by the American Battlefield Trust and turned over to the university. Tell us a little bit more about the story of how that was preserved and then how the university has decided to turn that into a basically a living laboratory so that your students can engage in the work of the historian, as you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, so for many, many decades, um, the property that's owned by the university was a golf course. Um, and, and that golf course um, had fallen into financial difficulties um, they put the property up for sale. And I, I remember discussions with different um, entities in the northern Shenandoah Valley about, you know, who was going to purchase this and save this. And ultimately, the American Battlefield Trust um, came in, purchased the property. But the trust traditionally, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong in this, they don't like to manage properties. They like to, you know, give them to an entity to, to manage and take care of. And I have to, to give a shout out to the president of Shenandoah, Dr. Tracy Fitzsimmons. Um, she very much saw an opportunity here when that property was, a, was, was preserved for the university to take it over um, from the trust and to use it as an outdoor classroom. And so there's, there's really two disciplines that use that property a great deal. One is environmental studies. 
And so, I mean, we have people who come out to that 195 acre property all the time. I mean, there's all kind of, you know, there's bald eagle nests and, you know, heron rookeries and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then the other piece of it is, is history. And so, you know, part of, part of the, the vision of the university is to use this as a laboratory for students to learn how to do history. And, and it's really important for students who, I mean, I think the, the large majority of our graduates, those who don't go into the classroom to teach, end up working in public history. And the one thing that, that students always need but necessarily can't get at the undergraduate level is real world hands-on experience. And so you can, you can have an academic exercise in the classroom, but it's not really for public consumption. And so, I mean, Cool Spring really is the whole reason that the university um, brought me there to teach and head the institute. So I'm grateful <laughs> that that the university, you know, ended up managing that property. But to really use it as an opportunity to teach them, you know, how to write wayside signs and develop walking tours and develop exhibitions. I mean, everything that we've done out there um, has been done as a student project under under my supervision, of course. And it's a challenge. I mean, you've written wayside signs. It is a challenge to, you know, put onto paper or put onto a sign 180, 200 words max, you know, something of great historical significance. Um, and so it's it's I think a unique opportunity for students to have hands-on experience, but do something that the public's going to interact with. And I think that's I think that's a unique part of of what Shenandoah is able to offer because of that battlefield. As you know, you know, the public always brings in an X factor and you don't know what question they're going to ask. They don't know. You don't know what their needs are, what what they're bringing to the story. And so that really requires a nimbleness on the part of the historian to be able to interact and and respond in a meaningful way. Yeah. 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 And, and just to have the students, you know, we have um, we've had volunteers now we have paid those since working out there in the summer. But just having those students, you know, working on the front lines in our in our exhibition area in the lodge. And I had a, a student I was training a couple of weeks ago asking me, you know, well, what what can I expect the visitor to ask? And I'm like, <laughs> you know, you'll learn over the years what what people are going to ask. But um, sometimes you just you just don't know it is it, it can be an X factor. Yeah. I was always surprised that the, the the number one question is where's the bathroom, and I said, "Well, yeah." yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, tell me about your involvement. Then they brought you in to basically manage your own battlefield, like that for a historian seems like a dream job. It is, yeah. So I had um, I was teaching at Lord Fairfax Community College, which is now Laurel Ridge in Middletown. So if, if listeners are familiar with the Battle of Cedar Creek, it it sat right in in the heart of that battlefield. And so after a university acquired that property in 2013, they needed to have a Civil War historian on staff. And Shenandoah had not had a Civil War historian on staff for a number of years. My undergraduate mentor at Shenandoah, Dr. Brandon Beck, had retired, moved away. And so, um, and they needed to be a, a Valley Civil War guy, Civil War historian. And so there's there's not a, you know, a huge arsenal of of historians who research and write about the civil war in the valley and also you know teach at a college or university and so that that was kind of my gateway to come to Shenandoah it started out as a visiting professorship um in 2014 for the for the uh, sesquicentennial of the battle and then that ex, you know it was extended for a couple of years and then they finally decided to you know offer me the full-time position as director of the institute and you know being able to um manage the the interpretation education out at that site um it really is an awesome and and humbling responsibility because you know as as i get to you know research this battle and particularly the the individuals who perish there and their families um i feel that in some way i'm breathing new life into these people that have that otherwise would be forgotten yeah yeah it's a it's a pretty heavy trust in that regard you know yeah. to be Interested with that. Yeah. yeah, you you've really done a lot to breathe a lot of life into the institute beyond the battlefield. Uh, and we'll come back to the battle and, and the book in a second. But I, I'm just very impressed with the work that you've done out there. You've got a, a great journal that you guys do. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So we publish annually um Journal of the Shenandoah Valley during the Civil War era. And this was this was my idea. Um and so a lot like emerging civil war, when I came to Shenandoah, 
um, I thought there's 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 a gap here. There's there's something that needs to be filled. And you know, I went back and I looked at at the different and there's not a whole lot of publications out there that are regular annual publications journals in Civil War history. And I went back and counted from like the past 40 years. And there were two or three essays in those journals that were in some way connected to the Shenandoah Valley. And I thought about, you know, when I go to conferences and present papers and have colleagues who present papers, and then you present the paper and it's like they die or they become a book. And sometimes, you know, the, there's not enough in a paper you present at a conference for it to become a book. And so I had this idea to, you know, create an annual journal um, and, and we're now going into our eighth volume. So our eighth year of the journal um, and, and it's been pretty well received. And we've, we've published, you know, a wide array of scholars who are, you know, well-established seasoned historians. Um, you know, we've had, you know, Alan Gelzo and Barton Myers have contributed. We've had undergraduate students. I've had my undergrads contribute. Um, we've had, you know, graduate students contribute. So it really gives people from from all stages in their career an opportunity to, you know, after they've researched something original or have a fresh perspective on something, to get it out there, to get published, um, and particularly for you know my undergrads, this gives them their their first publication. And you know, as again, as a professor, I want to see my students succeed, and there is no greater joy aside from you know seeing my son born or marrying my wife. Um, there is no greater joy than putting a hard copy of a journal into a student's hand and then opening up for the first time and seeing their name in a, in a byline. And so, you know, we have our, our next journal coming out um, toward the end of this year. We've got a what I think is a, a really good lineup. Robert Tanner, you know, the guy who wrote Stonewall in the Valley back in, what, 1976? He has an essay um, in the journal. So it's been amazing to me also to see um, the reach of it because, you know, one of my concerns when we started publishing was, am I going to have enough of submissions? And they slowly started to roll in. But now as the years progress, we we have, you know, a, a good quantity and good quality submissions coming in and it covers a wide array of things. So it's not, it's, it's military, it's social, um, you know, memory, reconstruction, slavery, all that kind of stuff. And it's really, a, you know, offers this, this wide array of, of material related to the Civil War era in the Valley. So then, you know, as your empire has continued to grow, um, our our new emerging civil war series book uh, that you've you've come up with is is part of that. I'm just delighted that we're able to collaborate on, on that book. Uh, it was really nice of you to think of us as, as you wrote it. Um, as you started to put this together, kind of as that next step, um, what is it that that kind of made you? I mean, did like did, did writing the book help you? appreciate this battle in a different way that you've been working with for so long? And did you fall in love with the battle in a different way or something like that? I think it, it, I think it deepened my passion for it because, you know, I've spent a lot of years with it, but, but when you're writing a book, you know, you're spending almost every day um, with this topic. The one thing that it did do uh, was it actually changed my thinking about certain things in the battle. And so I mean, Cool Spring, aside from, I mean, there's really not a lot of, of literature about the battle. Um, and there have been a, a couple of moments, until, you know, before I wrote this book that I thought, I just kind of discounted things. So for instance, um, if you were to take a tour of Cool Spring with me, you know, say a decade ago, I was not all that kind um, in my remarks to soldiers from Colonel Samuel Young's Dismounted Cavalry. Um, who initially were posted on the northern end of the Union line. And, you know, according to most accounts, when Robert Rhodes' division came out of this stand of oak trees and attacked the northern flank, Samuel Young's command, by, by most accounts, they fired, you know, a volley or two, and then the, lar the large majority of them, you know, just retreated back across to the east side of the Shenandoah River. And, you know, based on accounts of other soldiers from Colonel Joseph Thoburn's command, um, I mean, they thought it was cowardly what they did. And, and even looking at the National Tribune, they thought it was cowardly. But as I really began to, to kind of put together this book, um, one of the things that those accounts don't take into consideration is the training that these guys did not have. And so, you know, they're fighting as dismounted cavalry. Um, they are not using carbines. 
All right. So this 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 group of of a thousand men, they came from 27 different regiments. Um, they traded in their carbines for muskets a few weeks before the battle. They had received minimal training. And so there they are at Cool Spring. They're being asked to fight in formations with which they don't know how to maneuver in those formations because they're accustomed to being on horseback. They're not accustomed to shooting muskets. And so a lot of these guys, they fire that first round, um, they load, and they leave their ramrod on the field. And so they don't have a way to fire. And so either stay there and collect Confederate bullets and die or retreat. But also within, within that dismounted cavalry command, um, there are you know accounts of some guys who are staying. So within those widow's pension files, for instance, um, there are are these, I think, great examples of heroism where there are some guys from this dismounted unit who are staying there and fighting to the death and helping out all of those other regiments from Thoburn's command. So I think it helped reshape my thinking in that regard. Also helped reshape my thinking a little bit in terms of some of the soldiers from the Sixth Corps. Because in the in the little bit of literature that was that existed on the battle, you know, the Sixth Corps wasn't actively engaged. But as I started to look at the casualty lists and the roster of the dead, I thought, well, there's something going on because there are soldiers from General James Ricketts' division who were killed um, at that battle operating in, in support of artillery batteries in the bluffs or waiting along um, the western bank of the Shenandoah River. And so I think that kind of changed my perspective a little bit how we think about the Sixth Corps at the battle, particularly Ricketts' division. That, you know, these guys, I mean, guys in Thoburn's command, they were were not happy that Ricketts didn't come across and support them as, as Ricketts and Horatio Wright initially promised. But, you know, these guys are still under fire. I mean, they're providing, you know, critical support to artillery batteries. Um, they become casualties. And so they're they're engaged in the fight. And and that's something, quite honestly, that, you know, the the little bit of literature that exists never really highlighted before. It's like they're just there, they're waiting and, and you know, playing with the dandelions in the field, not doing anything. And that's not really, really the case. Give us a quick little overview of uh, like what actually happens in the battle, you know, for folks who are unfamiliar with. with yeah, the sure. So the battle starts uh, July 17th. And so the initial point of, of contact um, is at a place called Castleman's Ferry. So if people are familiar, you know, Route 7 that carries, you know, across the Blue Ridge through Snickers Gap, if you're heading toward Winchester, um, right where the Route 7 bridge crosses over the Shenandoah River, that's Castleman's Ferry. And so there was a, 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 a largely a cavalry action. Alfred Dufay commanded the lead elements of Horatio Wright's pursuit force. Uh, they clash with Confederates from Jubal Early's command at Castleman's Ferry all throughout, you know, the afternoon into the night of July 17th, they weren't able to dislodge the Confederates. The following day, um, after you know failed efforts again, George Crook, Horatio Wright, they met and they decided, well, let's flank the Confederate position. And so they had this plan to actually move north of Castleman's Ferry um, in pathways along the Blue Ridge Mountains, come across the property that was owned by Judge Richard Parker, which is owned by Shenandoah University now, cross the Shenandoah River at um, Island Ford, and then turn south and flank the Confederate position. What ultimately ends up happening um, is they, they, you know, are, they navigate through that, those pathways in the Blue Ridge. Interesting, and I write about this in the book, um, the way that they are able to get from point A to point B is because of a Union soldier, John Kerrigan. So John Kerrigan was actually a uh, resident of Castleman's Ferry before the war. He was a tailor. Um, he was well known in Clark County, Virginia, prior to the war as a great musician, as a drummer and a fifer. When the Civil War broke out, he actually enlisted um, in what became the Stonewall Brigade. And then the, the day after um, Stonewall Jackson evacuated Winchester, John Kerrigan deserted, ended up going to Maryland, enlisting um, in a Maryland Union unit was part of the Sixth Corps as it was coming from Fort, you know, from the defenses of Washington 
um, pursuing it early into the Shenandoah Valley. And so Kerrigan, it's a local guy who ends up getting them to Island Ford. But after they cross Island Ford, um, the plan basically changes. And so Horatio Wright, George Crook, they could see coming from the West additional forces from Early's command because that crossing an Island Ford, what Wright and Crook thought was going to be uncontested was actually contested. And so that, that small arms fire along the Shenandoah, that sounded the alarm. Ultimately, what happens um, is Horatio Wright tells George Crook, okay, keep Colonel Thoburn. So Colonel Joseph Thoburn, um, he is the, the combat, he's in charge of the combat command uh, during the Battle of Cool Spring. Mm -hmm. And so he keeps his men on that west side of the Shenandoah River, basically puts them in three lines. There's a line along the river, uh, about 75 yards up from the river is another line, and then there's a line of skirmishers in front of that. And so there's there's a, a lull of about an hour. So the Battle of Cool Spring really doesn't begin. What we think of traditionally as the Battle of Cool Spring doesn't begin until about five o'clock in the evening of, of July 18th, 1864. There's a series of frontal assaults that Early's command launches against the southern end of Thoburn's line. But those, as I tell people all the time, uh, those attacks are not the main attraction, but the main distraction. Because what Early wanted to do was give Robert Rhodes enough time um, in order to get in a position to attack the northern flank of Thoburn's position. And so, you know, once Rhodes attacks, then the, the, sh the focus of the battle shifts to that northern end of the line. And what happens is there are these moments where Thoburn loses a huge chunk of men rather quickly. So, you know, when Rhodes, uh, uh, you know, initially attacks um, Colonel Samuel Young's command, as I've already said, large majority of those guys, they shoot a volley or two and then they retreat. That's a thousand guys essentially taken out of the 5,000 men under his command. So he's lost 20 percent of his command almost in, in a matter of minutes. And then what happens is as the battle, as, as Thoburn begins to realize that the focal point is going to be the northern end of his line, um, he starts shifting troops from the southern end to the northern end. And while those troops are moving, he actually takes one of his brigades commanded by Colonel Daniel Frost and wheels them so that they're facing north, so that they're presenting a front to Rhodes. The problem is Gabriel Wharton's division is actually behind Frost's command now. And then you have, you know, Lieutenant Colonel Edward Murray's 5th New York Heavy Artillery is trying to stave off an entire Confederate division. Colonel Frost ends up getting mortally wounded. When he goes down, his brigade pretty much retreats. So you're losing about another 20% of your command. So it's at that point in the battle, you know, where, where things are going badly pretty quickly that Thoburn and the subordinates who are left, they have to make a decision. Do we stay and fight or do we retreat? And they think that the safest option is to stay and fight, you know, wait until darkness to come over the battlefield and then under the cover of darkness retreat across. And so there's there's a lot of tenacity on the part of, of Thoburn's men. I don't think Thoburn gets enough of credit um, for what he did at that battle and also in the Shenandoah Valley. And then his tenacity, as well as Union artillery, in the bluffs, in the mountains, shooting over the river, um, that's able to prevent those Union forces from being completely annihilated. And then once the sun goes down, they cross back over. Um, and this is where you have a really uncomfortable moment between Thoburn's troops and those soldiers from the Sixth Corps that Horatio Wright initially promised, uh, commanded by General James Ricketts. And they're saying, you know, why didn't you come over and help us? We, we were expecting you. Um, and every, you know, account that I've read of, of soldiers who are, you know, rank and file said we wanted to very desperately, but General Ricketts and General Wright wouldn't allow it. And that raised all these questions after the war, after the battle, and then, of course, after the war. Um, and I write about this in the book about the post-war fighting that goes on among Thoburn's veterans against veterans of the Sixth Corps, because they were of the opinion that had you come across and supported us, we would have carried the day, not only survived, we would have won. That could have been the last battle in the valley. Early could have been destroyed. Obviously, that didn't happen. And so there were all these theories that were, you know, popping up after the battle and in the decades after the war, one of which is that Horatio Wright did it intentional uh, because Horatio Wright did not like George Crook. 
And if you think about the relationship between those two guys, particularly during Sheridan's campaign, um, you know, on the eve of the Battle of Fisher's Hill, there's a lot of fighting going on between Crook and Horatio Wright. I don't think there's much stock in that. I think Wright was thinking that ultimately there was nothing that would be gained. We're, we're just going to be needlessly sacrificing um, another division. And so, you know, to, to again, to these guys, and, and these are guys who had, you know, would go on to fight at Third Winchester and Fisher's Hill and Cedar Creek. This is the battle that's consuming their earthly existence for the rest of their lives is is refighting this battle you know playing that that what if game you know what if ricketts would have crossed so it, it just had a profound impact um even if you weren't wounded or you know not a family member who suffered the loss of a loved one um these veterans are playing that what if game for you know really until until they they go to the grave is wright's decision there um a microcosm of Lincoln's concerns about Wright in the wake of Fort Stevens and, and why he taps ultimately t uh, has Grant tap Phil Sheridan. Yeah, I, I think it is. Um, I think that, you know, Wright is a, is a capable Corps commander, but he's not commanding a Corps. He's commanding an army at, at this stage, independent command. And, and I will say, you know, when you and I write about this in the book, when you start looking at all the communications between Stanton and Lincoln and Lincoln and Grant and Stanton and Grant and Grant and Halleck and all this kind of stuff. Um, Wright, I think, gets a, a confusing message from the higher ups. Okay. And so, you know, I think what Wright is hearing is partially, you know, just just pursue Jubal early and get him as far away from Washington as possible so that he's not a threat. Um, whereas Lincoln wants, you know, Jubal early destroyed. I mean, Lincoln is, a, you know, he is just ticked off beyond belief after Fort Stevens, you know, there's there, there's the famous quote from Jubal early, um, you know, talking to Henry kid Douglas about, you know, what did the advance to Washington achieve? And, and he says, you know, we haven't taken Washington, but we've scared Abe Lincoln like hell. I don't think Lincoln was scared like hell. I think he was pissed. Um, and, and ultimately, President Lincoln wanted early destroyed. That's not what Wright was being told. And I think ultimately um, that, that that factors into Wright's thinking at Cool Spring. You know, so if, if I am I'm sending rickets across and needlessly sacrificing, I, I don't think Wright ever wanted to be in that situation. He wanted to be, you know, back in, in with the Army of the Potomac. And so he's thinking if if early is pushed and I don't have to sacrifice soldiers from the sixth corps, I'm good with that. But yeah, I, I think this is this is something that that Lincoln is very, you know, keenly aware of, and he doesn't see the aggressiveness in right that that he needs to see. Yeah, I think uh, people sometimes forget like Lincoln had a real killer instinct for that kind of stuff. You know, like mm -hmm. destroy this army, destroy those forces, yeah. and yeah. And, Right doesn't okay. quite live up to that. The other, yep. the other person you spend a lot of time with in this battle, and as someone you spent a lot of time with in the valley, is um, on the other side, Jubal Early. What does this battle tell us about Jubal Early? Yeah, I, I think it. It one of the things it, it says about Early, um, there is no quit in him. Um, and you know, if you look at Jubal Early, not only from, you know, the when he first gets into the valley in June of 1864, but you look at the whole time that he's in the Shenandoah, uh, Jubal is Jubal Early is very stubborn, very cantankerous, and he's very well aware of what Robert E. Lee wanted him to do when he left Petersburg back in June to come to the valley and, and clear the valley and, and threaten Washington, D.C. And I think always ringing in Jubal Early's ears was that if you cannot create and continue to maintain this, you know, Shenandoah Valley as a diversionary theater of war. You just have to quit it. You have to give it up and you have to come back to the Army of Northern Virginia. And I think if you look at, I mean, Early is exhausted. I mean, first and foremost, by the time Early's men, you know, cross Snickers Gap, cross the Shenandoah on the 16th of July, Early and his men, they are tuckered out. I mean, people, you know, talk a lot about Stonewall Jackson and his 1862 Valley campaign. And the hundreds of miles um, that they marched between, you know, March of 1862 and June of 1862. Um, Early's men between mid-June and mid-July put almost 700 miles on their feet. 
So, I mean, it, 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 it far outpaces what, what Jackson's men are doing in 1862. And I think early is determined to do everything in his power to keep the Valley as a diversionary theater for, I think he understands that, you know, as Jackson said, if this Valley is lost, Virginia is lost. I think Jubal early understood that. And that's why he does what he does. And so, I mean, you see his tenacity at cool spring. Um, you see it, you know, six days later at second Kernstown, you see it at third Winchester, you see it at Fisher's Hill. And certainly, you know, I mean, who, who in their right mind would think that Jubal early on the morning of October 19th, 1864 would launch a surprise attack against the army of the Shenandoah, an army that has beat him uh, decidedly, you know, over the previous month. And so there really is, is no quit um, in Jubal early. What I've always found interesting about early and this extends, you know, a little bit beyond the, the parameters of the book is that once he started to lose, um, there were there was a growing chorus of people in his army and also among Confederate civilians in the valley to remove him from command. And so, you know, early had done, you know, amazing work throughout the summer of 1864. But once he started to lose and particularly you see this after Fisher's Hill, um, people want him gone. And they're actually proposing John Breckinridge. A lot of Confederate civilians are writing to Jefferson Davis after Fisher still saying, early needs to go, replace him with John Breckinridge. Breckinridge will do a better job. And of course, the guy who always intervenes um, and protects early is Robert E. Lee. Right. I mean, Lee, I think, understands what early is up against and, and he's not going to fire him you know, just because he's losing. Now, after Waynesboro in March of 65, yeah, at least like it's time to call it yeah. quit. But even there, uh, Early's um, letter was pretty gracious, uh, surprisingly for the yeah. cantankerous guy that he was. Yeah. Now, the other kind of factor in all this that we, we've touched on a little bit, but the battlefield itself poses mm -hmm. some real interesting challenges to these forces. I mean, they're fighting with a river in the middle of the battlefield. Um, it makes it hard to get back and forth. There are islands in the middle of the river that pose some challenges. There's a really weird whirlpool <laughs> that causes. Yep. Um, and then you get to kind of show people around all that, which I think is is pretty yep. good. Tell me about the the geography and topography of the battle a yeah. little bit. So it's 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 fascinating. So I mean, there are there are you know numerous natural environmental obstacles for these soldiers to overcome. So you had mentioned the whirlpool in the river. So it's called Parker's Hole, and so. You know, there's this this spot. If you visit Cool Spring and you've been there with me, Chris, you know this. Um, you don't even need a sign to tell you where Parker's Hole is at because the, the waters get really dark green and they're swirling and it's frothy on some occasions. Um, and so this is this is like a 25, 30 foot abyss um, in the midst of, a, of the Shenandoah River, which in the summer of 1864 is quite fordable. You know, so so based on, you know, the accounts that we have, um, soldiers are, are maybe the water's coming up to the, you know, their knee, maybe mid thigh. But if you're a retreating soldier on the night of July 18th and you forded the river at Island Ford, which is about a mile or so from Parker's hole. And you're thinking, well, this is going to be easy. I just splash across and, and I'm done. I'm on the other side. I'm safe. And then these guys get to Parker's hole and they're unaware and they plummet to the bottom and they drown. We actually uncovered, you know, in the in the stories of, you know, from the National Archives, the widow's pensions, we uncovered, I believe it's five individuals who's given as their cause of death drowning in Parker's Hole. Um, and there are these accounts from fishermen in, in Clark County in like the 1920s and 30s of, you know, fishermen dropping a line down in Parker's Hole and putting, you know, pulling up a bayonet or a musket barrel or something like that. So Parker's Hole is a major, major obstacle. Um, the islands are major obstacles. Um, the battlefield, basically it sits in a valley. And so, you know, you have the Blue Ridge Mountains is, is, you know, on the Union side of the river, and then it slopes up to this upland ridge, um, on the, on the Western side of the Shenandoah river. But even, you know, you have on the, and I write about this in the book. So on the, on the Eastern side of the mountain, um, it was heavily wooded. And so Confederates on the 17th, of July, when the cavalry were coming down those slopes and trying to attack a Castleman's Ferry, were actually aiming their cannons not at the soldiers but at the trees, and trying to you trying to break off the limbs and use tree limbs as shrapnel 
And there are accounts of, of soldiers being wounded, you know, being impaled with a tree limb or something mm -hmm. like that. So, I mean, what a horrible, horrible thing um, to happen. And then even, you know, I write about in the book, even when the, where the Shenandoah is fordable, um, there are, it still poses challenges. So one of the stories I write about in there involves a private from the 170th Ohio, John Goondy. He was a Quaker and the 170th Ohio was, was largely a Quaker regiment. Um, as he was crossing the river. So this is after the initial skirmish along the banks is over. This is not a contested crossing at this point. He gets stuck on, on something, you know, the accounts say it's a snag and he really got his foot lodged into something and he yanked it out with his buddies, ended up rupturing his groin uh, to the point where infection set in. He ended up dying from that um, in, in October of 1864. And so, you know, that's kind of one of the other dimensions of the book is is showing how environment impacts battle. So, you know, Union soldiers have Confederates as their enemies and Confederates have Union soldiers, but they all have the environment as their enemy. And then, of course, you think about, you know, the the god awful heat and humidity. Um, it, it poses many, many challenges. And even after the battle is over. So once the Union Army crosses back over on July 21st, after Jubal Early has withdrawn, because he hears about another Union force under William Avrell coming from Martinsburg to Winchester and Early doesn't want to get sandwiched in the middle. Um, I found evidence that there was a tornado um, near the battlefield that day. One of the surgeons in the 6th Corps, 121st New York, Surgeon John Holt, um, he said that it was a real ripper. And there are accounts from soldiers in the 19th Corps talking about guys being struck by lightning and killed by lightning. So, I mean, environment is is a is an enemy that people have to think about when they when they visit a battlefield as well. Although I think we could safely tell our listeners that if they would like to listen, uh, visit the battlefield, it will be a much more pleasant experience. That's correct. Yeah, That's correct. Right. Can't guarantee. So if, yeah, what's that? Can't guarantee. I can't guarantee it'll be <laughs> cool, but. So, if folks do want to visit. How can they do that? Yeah. So it's. Um, it, the site is open year round, sun up till sundown. Um, so if it's it's free to visit, um, if you visit when we have staff in the lodge, you know we we are always happy and glad to accept donations, but it's not required. Uh, we do offer a printed tour guide that you can take for free. We also have handouts out there about in, uh, the the lives of enslaved people on the property, but it's located um, for GPS purposes at fourteen hundred Parker Lane in Bluemont, Virginia. And so when you turn off a of Route 7, you'll you'll start going down Parker Lane. It looks like the road to nowhere, but it's the road to somewhere. It's the road to the battlefield. So don't be frightened by that. I mean, it really is a, a very beautiful, peaceful, serene site. And, you know, oftentimes when, when I go to Civil War battlefields, whether it's Cool Spring, oftentimes I, I spend a lot of time at Antietam because I live not too far from there. You know, I think about the juxtaposition of, of what happened there in those historic moments during the Civil War that terrible carnage and sacrifice and tragedy and how they today are such very peaceful contemplative uh sites where you can learn a lot about the battle and the human experience and how people deal with with tragedy and and move on from those experiences yeah the bloody angle at spotsylvania is my spot to do that very same thing yeah. so and, and the battlefield is just a hop skip and a jump outside of winchester so if you're in winchester real easy to get to nice and convenient and a yeah. short trip out there well worth it i really enjoyed my trip to the battlefield when you took the time to show us around yeah. so um so uh anything else you want folks to kind of take away from as they look at the book so there's just one other thing um so this book, all of the proceeds from this book um, are coming back to the McCormick Civil War Institute and and to support all of our interpretive educational efforts out at Cool Spring. So as I said, we don't we don't charge, you know, entrance fees or anything like that. It's all free and open. But I mean, there are there are costs, you know, just in maintaining signs and making sure there's tour brochures out there. So anybody who who purchases a copy of the book um, you are also helping to continue to educate and help protect that that important historic site. I know for the 160th anniversary of the battle, you guys have some events that you'll be doing. You want to tell us a little bit about we that? We do, yeah. So on Saturday, July 20th, we have a, a full slate of activities. So I'll be giving a walking tour. Last about an hour and a half, starts at 9.30 that morning. We meet at the lodge. Um, then at noon, John Tracy, 
um, who many of your listeners uh, and viewers know, a uh, historian at Cedar Creek and Bell Grove National Park. Um, John will be there speaking about Colonel Joseph Thoburn. So he actually wrote a piece for the book on Cool Spring about uh, Colonel Thoburn, who has a really interesting career. Um, he ends up being, you know, mortally wounded. He dies at the Battle of Cedar Creek. Um, and is and again is one of those officers officers that I think is overlooked. Uh, we'll have a, a celebration of of the book and a book signing at one o'clock that day. So if you're in the area and 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 you know want to stop in, it'll be air conditioned in the lodge, nice and beautiful, um, and you can pick up a copy um, for yourself. And then of course you know we'll have the the walking trails open all throughout the course of the day. And then one of the other things we're going to have um, is an art exhibition out at at Cool Spring in the lodge. So if, if any of your uh, viewers and listeners are familiar with the Time Life Voices of the Civil War series, um, in, the, in the frontispiece to a lot of those books are these really beautiful works of art, these maps or whatever. Um, the artist who created these maps or these images um, was Paul Salmon. So Paul Salmon passed away a few years ago. Um, his widow reached out to the Institute and asked us if we wanted to have these these things, oh, wow. uh, and these are super cool because when you look at them in in the Time Life series, you know they're small. I mean, these are like you know eighteen by thirty inch watercolors. My favorite one is uh, the winter camp scene he did that appears in the uh, Soldier Life volume of the Voices of the Civil War. So we're going to have those on on display. These are the first time that these things in their original form are ever available for public viewing. Wow. So that's uh, an added thing to come out and see as well wow so and the, the day is, called the day is the day is free. yeah the day is free it's all free that that day yeah the book is called the blood tinted waters of the shenandoah the battle of cool spring by jonathan Noyalis. and uh, we're super excited to be able to collaborate with the um, mccormick institute to make this happen all proceeds go to benefit the institute so jonathan thanks so much for being with us today yeah thanks so much chris and thanks for the opportunity i appreciate it Absolutely. I'm Chris Bukowski for the Emerging Civil War Podcast. Thanks for being with us. We'll see you online and on the battlefield.